No, the reason I say you people perish at this because you go bring that animal, Hulk Hogan, for no reason because I don't know the guy, I never met the guy. No, Mr. Hogan, you are big. On June 7th, 2023, Hossein Khazro Ali Vaziri, known to professional wrestling fans around the world as the Iron Sheik, passed away at the age of 81. His family released a statement saying, We gather with heavy hearts to bid farewell to a true legend, a force of nature, and an iconic figure who left an incredible mark on the world of professional wrestling. To say the Iron Sheik was larger than life feels like an understatement. During his heyday, the mere sight of him in his trademark red checkered Arab headdress was designed to provoke a strong emotional response, and nobody was more effective at riling up an audience with his thickly accented pronouncements than the Iron Sheik. He made his debut in the then nascent World Wrestling Federation in 1979, precisely when tensions over the Islamic Revolution in Iran were at a fever pitch, and together with Vince McMahon, Hulk Hogan, and a handful of others capitalized on the historical moment to catapult professional wrestling from a largely local form of traveling entertainment into a truly global phenomenon. By adopting the persona of the Iron Sheik, he gave wrestling exactly what it needed, a true antagonist for the ultimate all-American hero in Hulk Hogan. It worked so well that the rest of American popular culture seemed to copy the blueprint. Think of Rocky draping himself in the American flag and fighting the Russian menace Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. And the Iron Sheik was at the center of it all. To true wrestling fans, his presence was just perhaps even more important to the rise of Hulk Hogan than Andre the Giant, who may have legitimized the superhuman strength of Hogan when he body slammed him in WrestleMania III in 1987, but the Iron Sheik is the guy who built Hogan into a legend in the first place several years earlier in 1984, and you just heard that clip, when Hogan took the belt from the Iron Sheik and was the first wrestler to escape the Sheik's patented camel clutch. And far from gently retreating from the spotlight in retirement, the Iron Sheik remained in the popular consciousness for decades after he left the ring, turning in memorable interviews on Howard Stern and fully embracing the mantle as the ultimate heel long into the new millennium. But outside of the ring, Khosro was a devoted family man, a loving and dedicated father to his three children and devoted husband to his wife, Carol, for 47 years. It seemed to many that the stability of his personal life served as a sort of bedrock for him, allowing him to really lean into his villainous persona without ever losing himself fully in the role. And maybe there's some truth to that. What's undeniable is that the outpouring of tributes from family, friends, colleagues, and fans around the world in the immediate wake of his passing serves as a testament to his enduring legacy and underscores how this death left a hole in the wrestling world that can never truly be filled. I'm Derek Kaufman. I'm Jason Beckerman. And this is a special episode of Last Days, The Iron Sheik. Born to a poor family of pistachio farmers in rural Iran, Kaz, as he was known to his friends growing up, became the most acclaimed youth wrestler in the wrestling-obsessed country of Iran, though he never reached the pinnacle of his sports, being cut from both the 1964 and 1968 Iranian Olympic teams. He parlayed his notoriety into a job as a bodyguard for the Shah of Iran in the late 1960s. He later emigrated to the United States uh, in the early 1970s. You got to remember, this is long before the Iranian Revolution. Iran and the United States were at the time allies. As a matter of fact, Iran was the, uh, other than Israel, the largest U.S. ally in, in the Middle East. And Kaz began training with the American Wrestling Association after his arrival in the United States. He was coached by legendary wrestling trainer Billy Robinson, who, so it happened, was at the same time working with a young American wrestler by the name of Ric Flair. Kaz had trouble breaking out with fans, performing only in preliminary matches before scant crowds until, in the late 1970s, famed wrestling promoter Vern Gagne suggested he adopt a heel persona and lean into his Middle Eastern roots. So as Derek alluded to, he shaved his head, grew a pointy mustache, donned a headscarf, and curled-toed boots. He was and went by the, the uh, moniker at the time, the Great Hussein Arab, is what he called himself, which is his character in the late 1970s. It's sort of interesting. He called himself the the Arab, that awful term uh, denoting an Arab, and also uh, then later became the Iron Sheik. Sheik being a, 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 a name for that's a regal title. It's a regal title yeah. for Arabs. I, Persians, Iranians, are not Arabic. Right. They are, but he was the he well realized the American audience would not recognize the distinction between somebody from Iran and somebody from an Arab nation, and so he just again leaned into this persona in an effort to be what he was, a showman. Yeah, look, you know, the world of wrestling in the early '80s. Some it's hard to talk about it without talking about these ethnic stereotypes right. that they used. I mean, Iron Sheik was the biggest example, but he wrestled in tag team with a guy named Volkev, who was the Russian menace. Right? I mean, he. Was 
was a guy who came out to the Soviet anthem. Right. You needed clean heroes and villains, and that's what really popped wrestling. Now, these weren't uh, sensitive portrayals. They were deeply no. ethnic stereotypes, but the way he pulled it off, uh, he just became so larger than life. He and Volkov would, would win matches, and then he would scream, Russia is number one, Iran is number number one, death to America, and then spit when people would chant, you know, the audience would chant USA, USA, and he would spit on the floor. It's hard to imagine this happening today. I guess it could, but it's sort of hard to imagine leaning so far in to such a horribly ethnic stereotype that wasn't even his ethnicity, by the way. No, but, it, it makes yeah. you squeamish to even think about it. And you can watch some of the <laughs> right. old footage. And, you know, we did an episode of Last Days on Macho Man Randy Savage, who also leaned into this sort of heel role where he was very, very good on the mic. He had this very distinct voice and Iron Sheik was sort of the same thing. And there's this old episode of Howard Stern. There's a clip on the internet. We're going to play you part of it. It is profanity laced, but I wanted to give an indication of just how villainous and how committed to their roles they really were. So a guy calls in who may or may not be the actual Randy Savage and the two of them just go at it. Macho Man Randy Savage is on the phone. Fuck the Macho Man Randy Savage! Let him talk! Macho. You jabroni, yeah. The reason why your wife don't fuck you is because she wants a real man like the Macho Man Randy Savage. Fuck you and fuck your wife! I have a talent! Fuck you, Randy Savage! (laughs) All right. You gotta gotta understand. He was the villain of villains, By the way, this clip... They're into their 50s now. Oh, yeah. They haven't wrestled in forever, and they're still bringing this kind of energy and feigned vitriol, I guess vitriol, feigned vitriol, I don't know. And they don't break character. No. That's the beautiful thing. I've told you, he was a family man. This guy was married for nearly 50 <laughs> years. He has three kids. He was the rock of stability for his family. But when he would come out in public or he'd go to an interview on the Howard Stern show, which really, I, I wanted to touch on Howard Stern, it really introduced him to legions of new fans. I'm a little bit young, actually, for the Iron Sheik, but I remember the Howard Stern interviews because because he's such a huge personality. He never broke character. He would yell at the other wrestlers. He would tell you how much he hated Hulk Hogan to the point where a lot of the stories about the Iron Sheik and Hulk Hogan are shrouded in a bit of mystery. Does he really hate they, Hulk Hogan? Oh, oh no, I, I think they really d- genuinely dis- did not like each other, which happens sometimes in professional sure. wrestling, in combat sports generally, where it's hard, especially wrestling, which is this bizarre mixture of reality and fiction, right. where where typically, you know, there, there, there's some sort of at least grudging respect. These guys really disliked each other. Yeah, you don't see any of the collegiality, the right. sportsmanship right. that you see in other rivalries and, you know, major American sports. You really saw hatred, and that's what fueled the rivalry. It made Hulk Hogan bigger than he would have ever well, been. Well, let's talk about that point for a second. So in 1984, and you talked about this a minute ago, Madison Square Garden, the two of them face off. Hulk Hogan was famous, maybe the most famous person in the sport, but he was not a a superstar at that point. He was coming off of the Rocky Three movie. He That's had already right. had a, attained a level of fame, but even remember in Rocky Three, he's called Thunderlips. He's right. not a, a name brand in the same way. So at that time, the Iron Sheik has the World Wrestling Federation title, and Hulk, who was not actually supposed to be in that fight, and I, I, I apologize, I can't remember who it was that was supposed to fight the Iron Sheik at that at that in that match, actually had to step aside because of an injury. Hulk steps into that role, and he defeats the Iron Sheik. They hated Iron Sheik, you know, the American audience has hated him. He defeats the hated, hated uh, Iron Sheik. And because of that role, Hulk Hogan, because of that fight, Hulk Hogan becomes the superstar. Superstar is a household name that transcends wrestling by by any measure. And it's it's largely because of that. And so it's hard to believe these two men. And by the way, the Iron Sheik becomes vastly more famous, too, as yes. the villain to Hulk Hogan's hero. It's hard to imagine how these two didn't recognize that they desperately needed each other and had each other to thank for their incredible rises to fame. Yeah, I mean, he's Lex Luthor to Superman. That's they right. don't exist without each other in, in a very, very real fashion. But I, w- I mentioned it at the top. To casual wrestling fans, you think of Andre the Giant. You think of Hulk Hogan lifting Andre the Giant and slamming him, which was a hugely important moment. But it was really the Iron Sheik who already launched Hulk right. Hogan. By the time Hulk Hogan was slamming Andre the Giant, if you are, are in the know about wrestling— Hulk Hogan was already huge. It was sort of a fait accompli to sort of pass the torch officially from the giant and show how big Hulk Hogan was that he slammed an actual giant. But he was already launched into the stratosphere by Iron Sheik. So I'm old enough to remember when Rocky III came out and we had never heard of Thunderlips. We had never heard of Hulk Hogan. I was a wrestling fan. I knew most of the characters. I'd never heard of him. He then becomes pretty famous, Hulk Hogan does, as a result of that movie. 84 comes along and you have these various villains that are starting to emerge. The sport itself is becoming huge. Uh, and then you have this fight in 84 for the World Wrestling Federation title. 
and the two of them fight in Madison Square Garden. You've got the entire Massive. place is full of Americans waving American flags. You've got this anti this villain, not even an anti hero, this villain in the Iron Cheek that's fighting him. Everybody is caught up in anti Iranian fever at the time. It's just hard to if you're if you're not old enough to remember, you don't really realize how much the United States public hated the Soviet Union and hated Iran. And these were the villains. And these two, you know, he and Volkov were, were the two guys standing up. For these two countries, we knew it was fiction. It didn't change the fact we didn't like it. That's right. They were the avatars of this ongoing political yeah, conflict. Right. That was a very real thing. And, and you mentioned Madison Square Garden. This is where the biggest events in sports it shows happened. how big it was. It, it in '84, shows how big. Before, be, be, before the sport became what it what it became four years later. It's amazing. It's amazing that it filled up Madison Square yeah. Garden with zealot fans or people outside protesting the Iron Sheet. The whole thing. This is where Muhammad Ali had his big fights <laughs> right, against Joe right. Frazier. So it gives you a sense of wrestling at really the center of of American pop culture. Now, I want to talk a little bit about his his legacy in wrestling because he comes from an era in the '80s when he was the most popular. When you had these sort of gimmicky portrayals of ethnic stereotypes, wrestling doesn't really look that way anymore. But you can really see his influence in the way that the archetypes still exist. So right now, the biggest thing in wrestling is Roman Reigns. Mm -hmm. And he's the biggest, and he's the heel. So right. the Iron Sheik was always the villain. He was booed at by the crowd, uh, riotously booed. You were rooting for Hulk Hogan. People would come with American flags. It was seen as defeating evil. Now things have shifted. The Iron Sheik, uh, the new Iron Sheik is Roman Reigns, and he's the most popular guy in wrestling. It shows you how the sport has shifted. And if Iron Sheik had come along in the you know 2010s, he might be the Hulk Hogan, right. and Hulk Hogan would be the sort of squeaky clean, lamer sort of American clad wrestler. So it's interesting how it, he's, it he's a function of his time. It, it is, but we, we we just don't. I just don't think we lean into these ethnic stereotypes as much. I mean, what, who, who's the American enemy today? China, I guess it would be. It's too diffuse. You're just, right, yeah. but, but even if it wasn't, even if I mean, g given China is, I guess the ultimate, or Russia, maybe you just don't have these characters playing into those stereotypes anymore. Right. I can't imagine a Chinese American. He at this point, uh, the Iron Sheik was was an Iranian American. I can't imagine a Chinese American playing so directly into the stereotypes of a Chinese person and sort of saying the things about America that the Iron Sheik said about America. I, I just can't imagine it happening. The political times are just different. It's wild. Yet despite this, he had this sort of charm and wit yeah. to him. He was an elder statesman of wrestling. He's not a reviled figure. You know, you think about uh, stereotype portrayals in, in you know, cinema. You had a guy like Mickey Rooney playing an right. Asian stereotype, and it was reviled. It's looked upon as a, a, a shameful right. period in movies. That's this not the way not, Iron Sheik is, is not, really right. reviewed. He's, he's beloved, and I think it's largely because he was a family man. He had very close relationships with other other wrestlers, including The Rock. And I wanted to leave the final note of this episode to The Rock, who had a very close relationship with the Iron Sheik because his father was also a professional wrestler. He says he grew up calling him Uncle Sheiky in the house. He has all these great stories. And perhaps the most lasting one is how The Rock's famous expression, jabroni, calls every clown he sees a jabroni, actually came from the Iron Sheik. And I thought it only appropriate to give him the final word. Now the word jabroni is connected uh, to me, when a lot of people think, oh, jabroni, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a rock's word. No, 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 it's not my word. It's the Iron Sheik's word. Iron Sheik was the one who would use the word jabroni backstage, and it became this legendary Iron Sheik speak. It was always, you tell a jabroni, let me tell you jabroni, it was jabroni, jabroni, jabroni. I give the Iron Sheik all the credit in the world for the word jabroni.